Hello, Internet. We are live. Hey, everyone. Welcome to episode 51 of the Stanford MLS Seminar Series. I'm Karan. And as always, we have with us uh, Dan. Hey. Fyodor. Hello. Piero. Hey, everyone. And our guest today, Fred Sala from University of Madison, Wisconsin. Say hi, Fred. Hello. Um, so as always, we're going to do a 30-minute talk uh, by Fred, followed by a 30-minute podcast-style discussion where you in the live audience can ask questions, and we'll keep track of those questions even if you keep them coming um, during the talk. So um, a little bit about our speaker today. Fred is going to be talking to us about um, efficiently constructing data sets for diverse data types, and he's a professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, he's also a research scientist at Snorkel AI and was previously at uh, Stanford as a postdoc. So, Fred, do you want to take it away? Yeah. Thanks a lot, Karen, and thanks a lot, folks, for inviting me. It's great to be here. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our work on trying to lift these techniques and weak supervision, which we'll talk about, to all kinds of really interesting and crazy types of labels, make it more usable for a bunch of different machine learning tasks. All right, so the motivation for weak supervision in general is just the fact that modern supervised learning really needs a ton of data. A lot of our models are extremely data hungry. And of course, this is nothing new at this point. Um, already over 10 years ago, ImageNet came out with more than 10 million labeled data points. And it really kind of kicked off the deep learning revolution. So uh, having a big labeled data set is actually a good thing. And it really hasn't stopped. Even pretty recently, we have on the order of 30 million labels in image data sets, for example. The only problem with this is the fact that, you know, it's actually really expensive to label data. And once you do it, you have to kind of keep it that way. Or if you want to construct a new data set, you have to start from scratch. It's also very slow. You know, it takes a long time. And a lot of kind of work in machine learning has been dedicated to figuring out ways to try to sidestep this kind of thing, try to figure out a way around needing large labeled data sets. But oftentimes, it's just something that we need to be able to produce. So the goal of weak supervision is to try to accelerate this process. And the way we do that is that we take a bunch of what we call weak sources, basically these kind of not very accurate guesses of what labels unlabeled points should have. Um, we combine these and then we get these hopefully high quality pseudo labels that we can train a model with. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about this afterwards. So we supervision has actually been quite successful. Um, Snorkel, which started off as a open source project coming out of Stanford and is now a startup, has been one of the chief users of weak supervision. Um, but then a bunch of other organizations and industry and government and medicine and so on have also been very successful using it. So it's been quite powerful. The main thing that I'm going to focus on today isn't really classic snorkel. Um, it's more related to trying to understand what kind of labels we can build these automatic data sets for with weak supervision. So kind of right from the very beginning, um, folks who started working on these frameworks tackled binary classification, um, which is you know, not super surprising since that's one of the most interesting and kind of basic problems that we want to have. Um, you can lift that to multi-class classification. So you have a bunch of different discrete label possibilities. And then we've been working for a while on dealing with things like sequences. And there's been a lot of good works on trying to, to create weak supervision frameworks that tackle these different scenarios. Uh, this is just a small sampling of some of the papers that people have written for this. But in practice, machine learning tends to be quite a bit more diverse than this. And what I'm interested in is, you know, can we handle all these other kinds of tasks and problems? So of course, if we talked about classification, we should also talk about regression. So then the kind of label we'll have in our data set is going to be a real value or perhaps a real vector. And it doesn't really stop there. For example, we could have these other kind of very rich output spaces. Um, oftentimes, this is called structured prediction. So in this case, we don't have a discrete set of classes and we don't have a real value. We have something else. Um, one very popular case is rankings. right? So in this case, what we're predicting is some ordered list of preferences by some user. Here's examples of movies based on you know, their ranking set up in IMDb, just as an example. So we'd still like to do weak supervision. We'd still like to be able to 
quickly construct a label data set. But in this case, the labels are going to be rankings instead of being you know, plus or minus one or some real value. We can also go even crazier. One of the really cool spaces I like to work with is hyperbolic space. So these kind of weird looking <laughs> hyperboloids that you see there, though, that's hyperbolic space. Um, and what's going on there is that you have points that live on these surfaces. And it turns out that you'd actually want to be able to have labels or outputs in these surfaces um, because they have actually a very good representation power. All kinds of information can be represented very accurately if you do this in hyperbolic space. But again, if we want to construct a label data set where the labels are hyperbolic points, we have to think carefully about how to make that work. We don't have to stop with hyperbolic space. It's just one example of a manifold. Perhaps we want our labels to be points along these kinds of manifolds. Manifolds are these very general spaces. You can think of them as surfaces that live in other spaces or you can think of them as their own space with special geometric properties. So very often we'll want to be able to have labels that are just these kinds of special points. Now, if we don't like these continuous things, then you know, perhaps we'll look at something more discrete. So things like graphs, right? So on the left, we have a social network and you might wanna predict social networks. If you're given a list of people, you wanna predict the links between them. On the right is a kind of an old representation of the internet graph, but these could also be labels potentially. And of course, maybe the most popular kind of label for a graph is gonna be a tree. So very common is now to try to synthesize code. Um, if you're doing that, if you're generating code, what you're really doing is producing an output abstract syntax tree, an ASD. And that's what's going on, on the left. So very often we'll want our labels to be these kinds of trees. And then finally, one of the most classic NLP problems is semantic dependency parsing. And this is a task where you get a sentence and you produce a tree that encodes dependencies between the words in the sentence. Um, so this is also a really good task as a candidate for weak supervision because building a label data set here is really challenging, right? Typically what you'll have to do is to acquire a bunch of sentences in a language hire someone with linguistics expertise, and then have them sit down and produce these trees for every sentence. And of course, they have to speak the language at the very least. And that's becoming incredibly hard for a lot of languages that are endangered, languages where there are fewer and fewer native speakers of that language. So we'd like to be able to apply weak supervision to all of these kind of really diverse problems. But as we'll see, it turns out that a lot of the basics of the weak supervision framework have to be adapted and changed. And that's gonna be the subject of this talk. So we wanna know how to make weak supervision just generally work for really diverse label types. To do this, I'm gonna have a very brief introduction to kind of the technical aspects of weak supervision. Then we'll see what the challenges are when we change this to make it work for you know, manifold labels or other kinds of objects like this. And then we'll introduce a pretty simple solution that does this fusion of weak supervision and these kinds of structured prediction problems where the labels live in these richly structured spaces. Now, the, the key thing that we want here is that we don't want to design a new version, a new variation of the framework, you know, for each and every kind of label type. And we could do that, and maybe we could write a separate paper for each of those scenarios, um, but that's not very interesting. We'd like some general approach where we can just kind of plug and play the label type and just go ahead and do that. And, and this is what I've been working with with some of my students. So this is great work by Chang Ho, Winfred, Harit, and Nick. And as we found out about 20 minutes ago, this is gonna be at iClear this year. Cool, so I'm gonna just jump into this. This is kind of the, the overall pipeline, the framework for weak supervision in the snorkel formulation for it. So there's three phases to what we do in weak supervision. The first phase is to get these weak sources. So these are different ways of producing a guess of what the label for a data point should be. One of the really efficient ways of doing this is to just construct heuristics and then encode them, write them programmatically. So the, the problem here, which I'm sure unfortunately you can't see, is to do binary classification in a medical domain, 
where you're trying to figure out whether a patient has a particular disorder, which is this lung condition called pneumothorax. So here, for example, a very simple kind of guess, and we call these guesses labeling function, is just, uh, well, is the medical text report that we get to see short? Does it have 15 or fewer words? You know, usually these short ones indicate the fact that there's nothing wrong, right? That the patient is healthy. Now, of course, this is noisy. You know, sometimes a short one still indicates that the condition is there, but that's okay. We are allowed to be wrong here. The important thing is that we get multiple of these sources, and then we try to figure out how to combine them into something that's sort of the best guess. So this idea of having multiple labeling functions is actually quite flexible. Um, for example, one thing we can do is to plug other things in, not just heuristics. We can do things like looking up things in the knowledge base. We can use off-the-shelf models that aren't trained on this particular data set or task, but rather came from other settings. So it's a very flexible approach. The idea is to dump a bunch of sources of signal into this overall framework. Okay, so now that we have all of these different sources, you know, we have to figure out something to do with them because each of them are kind of noisy on their own and they're gonna contradict each other. They don't necessarily all agree on what they think the true label should be. And the second stage, this label model stage is what we'll actually use for this. So we'll find out a way to combine them into kind of the overall best guess or even better, maybe a distribution over guesses. Maybe we'll say, yeah, based on the votes that we saw, we think there's a 70% you know, chance that the condition is present, 30% chance that it's not. And then using these pseudo labels or these distributions, we'll go ahead and train some end model. And that can be any model that we like. Okay, so this is the basic idea. I'll focus predominantly on this middle step, this idea of kind of combining and modeling these different sources, because that's really where the challenge is when we try to make this approach work for these very general kinds of settings with different kinds of labels and label spaces. So let's get a sense of the intuition for, for why this kind of thing would work in the first place. And the analogy I like to give for these things is to think of a courtroom. So in a courtroom, we actually do have this kind of prediction we're trying to make, but we don't know what it is, right? And that's whether the accused person is guilty or not. And suppose we have these witnesses that are going to act as our sources or labeling functions, and they provide some guess of whether they think, you know, the person is guilty or not. So the first two and the fourth here say, yes, I think this person's guilty. And then the third and fifth say, no, I think they're not guilty. It doesn't quite work that way in the actual court system, but you know, this is just an example for us. Okay, so we have these conflicting guesses. You know, what's the simplest way that we have to combine them? Well, it turns out if we just kind of take the majority, that's maybe the simplest thing that we can do here. And if we had many, many, many different sources, then maybe this would actually be okay. But of course, I mean, there's ways to improve on this. And the easiest way is to think of the fact that these different witnesses have different levels of reliability. So perhaps the first and the fourth are very reliable. They have a very high probability here of getting the correct guess. And maybe these other ones like the second and fifth are not so reliable. We still care about all their votes, but we'd like to upweight these reliable, these accurate ones. So we're gonna to have to try to incorporate these accuracies into the story here. Another thing that we might be worried about is if some of these witnesses kind of coordinated on their own and got their story straight before court. In that case, we wouldn't want to trust them independently. We might not throw out their votes, but we might say, yeah, I don't, you know, this block of voters, let's downweight their total influence here. So we call this the correlation problem. And the way to improve our naive majority vote is to try to incorporate accuracies and correlations. All right, how do we actually do that? Well, we're gonna model them with a probabilistic model. This is a graphical model that just contains nodes that have each of these witnesses, each of these labeling functions. And they also have a node for the actual true label, which is latent. We never get to observe it. So then the idea becomes, we'd like to learn the parameters of this model and the parameters turn out to have a really simple form. These accuracies, these reliabilities we've been talking about, they look like this. They look like the expectation of a product. Assume these things are binary, they're plus or minus one. Then for example, if this lambda i and y agree all the time, 
then they'll both be plus one or both be minus one all the time. So this expectation is like always a one. And if they always disagree, then it'll always be a minus one. And if they're kind of random and you know don't correlate well, there'll be something in the middle like a zero. So we can think of these accuracies as a particular kind of parameter here. And the correlations have the same property, except they don't involve the true label. So interestingly, this kind of graphical model on the left, it can be captured by knowing these parameters on the right that exactly match up to our sort of intuitive ideas of what we want to learn about the witnesses. And it turns out that with some pretty simple math, if you knew these parameters, then you can compute this posterior, this probability that the true label is something conditioned on these labeling functions that we got to observe, these votes that we saw. So the whole trick becomes estimating these parameters, these accuracies and correlations. And the hard part, of course, is getting the accuracies because we don't get to see why. Like normally, if I say, let me estimate this mean, I would just look at a bunch of samples of it and take the average. And that's a simple thing to do. But since I don't know what Y is for any case, I don't really know how to do that, at least not immediately. All right, so what do we do here? How do we actually make this work? Well, what we'll actually do is we'll try to exploit these latent relationships with stuff that we actually do get to see these observables. So I've written an equation that holds under some conditions. If you look inside, what's happening here is I'm taking two of these accuracy terms, these products of labeling functions with the true label. And what I've written down is just this basic idea that they're uncorrelated. Right, so the actual labeling functions themselves are correlated because they vote on the same label, but their accuracies, their chances of being right is what's uncorrelated. And this holds under some conditions. And if we look at the left-hand side here, y shows up twice. And if you multiply, you get y squared, which is always positive, it's always one. So we can just rewrite this as this expectation of lambda one lambda two is equal to this product of these accuracy terms. And this is great because on the left-hand side, we have something that we do get to see. That's just the rate of agreement and disagreement between labeling functions. We get to observe that for all of these outputs of labeling functions that we see. And on the right are these accuracy parameters that we're trying to grab, right? These pieces of information that tells us how reliable our labeling functions are. Okay, so far we have an equation. Now we know the left-hand side the right-hand side is a product of the two things we want. We don't have enough information to solve yet, but I could just kind of write more of these equations with more labeling functions. And now I have three knowns and three unknowns, and I can solve this system, almost linear. I could take the log here, and it would be a linear system. Or I can just kind of multiply the equations and divide, and it, it turns out to have this really nice form. So here it, we have that the magnitude of this accuracy parameter we're trying to grab is this really, really simple function of different kinds of rates of agreement and disagreement between labeling functions. So this is awesome, right? We're getting information about something latent by only using observable terms that we can easily estimate from an actual set of labeling function outputs. Okay, so this is actually really great. And indeed, that's actually how these label models that do this work. Uh, these are just, you know, a set of variations on a theme. There are different versions of this. I've just shown one of the most simple ones. There are more sophisticated label models. And while I'm here, I should plug a new benchmark called Branch, um, which comes out of some folks labs at University of Washington. This is basically a bunch of data sets that allow you to compare different label models and see which work well in which scenarios. So this is actually a really cool project, but it's kind of orthogonal to our problem. Right. Just getting back to where we started, we were interested in how do we make this weak supervision business actually work when we have these more crazy types of labels that aren't binary. Right. So if we go back to our diverse types of labels, you know, it's not even clear that this multiplication makes any sense. Right. What is lambda one times y when these objects are like, you know, things in manifolds or graphs or things like that? So just right off the bat, a really simple idea here may not directly work. So we're going to have to do something a little bit different. So the first thing to think about is we still want this notion of accuracy, but it's going to have to be something else. Uh, 
And since we want to make this work for all of these different kinds of settings with all of these different types of structures, we want something that's actually in common. And what's in common with all these different types of labels? Well, we may not know, you know exactly where they all live and what kind of spaces they are and stuff like that. But on the other hand, they do have a way of kind of seeing when two of the labels are similar and when they're more distinct. So in other words, there's a way to measure distance in all these spaces. Right, if I have rankings, I can measure how close a pair of rankings is. In manifolds, there's often a distance function. In graphs, I could say, hey, how many edges do we have in a pair of graphs? In fact, there's a more generic term for this called a metric space. So what I can do is kind of take my modeling from having these binary accuracies that are based on agreement by multiplication to just operating with distances, right? I've just made this simple change replace my lambda times y, my products, with this distance. So before I wanted to make this product large on average, now I'm gonna to wanna to make this distance small, right? The more small the distance is, the more accurate my labeling function is. So I can do almost the same exact kind of modeling, just in a more generic setting where I can plug and play any distance I like, depending on what kind of space and what kind of labels I'm looking at. Okay, so what kind of distance functions do we see in structured predictions? Well, I mean, for rankings, there's actually a whole bunch of these that have been studied quite intensely. Um, one of these is called the Kendall Tau distance, which is how many adjacent swaps you need to take one list to the other. So here, for example, I can swap one, two, three, first take the three, swap it to the beginning, and then swap the one and two, that's three swaps to go from the first to the second permutation. For these manifolds, Basically, distances are just kind of like paths. You measure how long they are along the surface. And for regression, you can use the standard Euclidean distance and, and so on and so forth. The important thing is we want to get labeling functions that have a small average distance, because that's what makes them accurate. All right, before we even get to this, we might even ask you know, the baseline majority vote, what does it do here? What does it mean anymore? Uh, it's not actually clear because all of the outputs might be completely different, right? Like here's four different rankings, and yet they share things in common, right? I don't want to just output a random one. I still want to take things in common. So it turns out the easy thing to do here is rather than just saying what's the most popular, you say, hey, what object minimizes the total distance to all of the observed objects? It's kind of a, a type of center of mass or a berry center. And this turns out to be the thing that encodes best or most popular given these observed things. And by the way, this is actually very well known in special cases. Solving this problem is called rank aggregation. For manifolds, it's called the Frechet median. If you just plug in the squared Euclidean distance, you get kind of the standard Euclidean mean. So there's lots of like common things here. And if you plug in what's called the Hamming distance for just the binary case, you get back the regular majority vote. So really we are just kind of generalizing things. But of course, I mean, one of these terms could still be really, really bad, right? The distance could be horrible. Um, so we don't really wanna just blindly use majority vote. We still want these accuracies. It turns out that there's kind of equivalent equations that we can get. Just like in the old version, we had this nice product Oftentimes we'll get this nice kind of distance, right? Where the distance between observed labeling functions satisfies a relationship on the distances to the actual unknown true value. Doesn't always hold, it needs some strong assumptions, but it's nice because we just work through distances without anything else. This is called intrinsic um, models. If we can't do that, we'll have to go to what are called extrinsic models, which means we'll have to embed these objects into things like Euclidean space and use vectors from there and kind of do the standard weak supervision. And it turns out that this is very interesting as a problem on its own because we need to maintain distances correctly, right? All of these accuracies are about distances. So we want embeddings that preserve these distances. And these are called isometric embeddings. And finding a good isometric embedding is another major theoretical computer science challenge. OK, and assuming we can do this and we have these ways of doing it, the final kind of inference step is, well, we use our average distances. We get these special kind of parameters in our models. And then we just weight the majority vote. We give more weight to the accurate labeling functions and less weight to the inaccurate ones, which was exactly what we set out to do in the first place. 
And now we can do this generically for any kind of situation where we can define these distances. All right, so that's enough of the theory. The question is, does this actually work in practice? We tried it in a bunch of settings and it, it works quite well. So for example, we did rankings for movies and board games. And indeed, it, it works really nicely. The green curve on these plots is exactly our approach as you add more labeling functions. So right off the bat, it performs better than having a smaller data set with true labels. So this is better than supervised learning, but with fewer labels. And the more signal you add, the more labeling functions you produce, you end up being able to outperform a larger and larger clean data set. Eventually, you will converge to doing as well as 100% of the label data. Similarly, you can do better than majority vote, which is you know, perhaps what you'd expect. If you have these different quality labeling functions, then modeling and learning those accuracies obviously is something that does much better. And even if you only have partial ranking information, so for example, just having pairwise comparisons, you can still actually do really well, especially compared to this naive majority vote. Finally, we did this for things like graph and tree recovery, and we're especially excited by the results that we ended up getting for dependency parsing. We used as our labeling functions, just off the shelf parsers trained on different data sets. So we took some of the typical data sets, for example, for check, and then we, we took some parsers trained on these data sets and we applied them to new and different data sets. We didn't really do anything here. We just plugged it into this method. We defined kind of a distance on trees. And then we ended up getting better overall performance for a lot of different settings just by plugging these in. So this seems like a nice way just to go ahead and kind of take pre-trained models and try to apply them to new tasks with no labeled data while still being able to capture the fact that they have different average performance. Now, we haven't been able to beat state-of-the-art results yet just by doing this, but we think with a more sophisticated modeling of distances, we could actually do that as well. And finally, we did things like graph recovery. This is just a really simple kind of sanity check here. Um, on the left is when your labeling functions have no information. They're terrible. You can't predict anything correctly. On the right, they're very informative, so you can get 100% accuracy. The interesting stuff is in the middle, and it kind of behaves exactly the way you'd expect. If all your labeling functions are of the same quality, then you know, majority vote and our label model are approximately the same. There's no magical information to do better with. But if you have these heterogeneous ones where there's varying quality, then indeed you get a bunch of boost from modeling these different accuracies. And again, you can do this for almost any kind of label model or for any kind of label setting you'd like. You just need to have these notions of distances that you can go ahead and plug into this. So we're very excited for a bunch of the different directions that we can tackle here. We've just kind of scratched the surface here initially. One of the things that we're working on now is trying to predict more complicated structures. And one of the most interesting things there is trying to capture DAGs that encode causal structure. So causal inference is all about trying to understand exactly what variables are causes of other variables. And there are many really remarkable methods for looking at observational data and trying to pull out these causal structures. But it's a, a very, very hard problem. So different techniques have different levels of reliability. So trying to use this idea of the structure prediction and weak supervision to combine them is something that we're very excited by. We also want to design much better labeling functions. Right now, we're kind of stuck with using a lot of off-the-shelf models because it's hard to really by hand create good labeling functions. It's kind of the bottleneck for us at this point. One of the things we like to do is to integrate the information in big models like foundation models to be able to do this. Uh, in fact, ideally, we just like to ask a foundation model to tell us what it thinks the output is and just to use that potentially as one of our labeling functions. And then finally, all these metrics, all these distance functions that we talked about, they're kind of like the off the shelf ones that we've seen in the literature. It doesn't necessarily mean it's the right choice, right? Our labeling functions may have reliabilities controlled by you know, potentially very different metrics. So we'd like to design better metrics. And to do that, we may wanna hand design a better metric, but maybe we wanna learn it. And maybe even here, we wanna weekly supervise it, which means another level to these things. Um, but we're very excited about all these different possibilities, and we hope that we can then start using a lot of weak supervision techniques to basically replace hand labeling across all of these 
super varying kinds of label spaces. All right, I'm going to wrap it up there. Thanks a lot for, for everybody and uh, love to take some questions and chat more. Awesome. Thanks so much, Fred. That was a great talk. Um, and we got a bunch of questions in uh, the YouTube uh, chat. I want to also remind folks <clears throat> in the audience to send in more questions and we'll uh, get those across to Fred. Um, so yeah, I guess to kick things off, um, you know, there was a question pretty early in your talk about um, when does majority vote fail? And uh, as you were going through your talk, you know, I also had uh, uh, maybe a similar question in the sense that um, I think in the standard kind of weak supervision setting, um, the premise is that it's really easy to write these labeling functions and, and you can get a lot of them. And then the aggregation that you do with the label model um, helps you do better than majority vote. So I was curious in, in this kind of, uh, you know, more general setting where you might have to write down labeling functions or find labeling functions for more complex objects, um, whether, you know, some of those kind of real world assumptions hold up, can you get access to, you know, the amount of labeling functions you might need and how does that performance with majority vote that kind of compares and how does that change? And, and yeah. does it look favorable? Um, yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. So the basic idea for majority vote is that it makes a couple of strong assumptions. And those are exactly the ones that we set out to kind of solve for. So the first assumption is that they're all kind of equally reliable, right? Um, and in practice, that's not true at all. These different sources are gonna have quite different levels of accuracy. And the second thing is this correlation thing, right? Like if a bunch of them are very well correlated, they really act like one piece of information rather than treating them all as independent ones. But I mean, if you actually do meet the assumptions in the ones that the majority vote makes, then yeah, the label model can do no better. And we saw an example of that at kind of the end of the talk there. Um, yeah, in practice though, most of the time, majority vote isn't gonna be the winner because you do have these kinds of violated assumptions and you hope to be able to actually capture that. Now, of course, just as you said, if you end up having a huge number of labeling functions, then you know majority vote will kind of cancel out the noise and the differences and you'll be okay. But the more difficult the problem, the more difficult it'll be to gather thousands, you know, potentially of labeling functions. We'll have to stick to fewer. Um, so indeed, that's actually where we really care about having a very effective label model. And yeah, the actual challenge of constructing labeling functions, for me, that's actually the, the new biggest challenge of weak supervision. And we're working more and more on ways to kind of automatically construct these labeling functions, especially via techniques like program synthesis, for example, which is hopefully right. something that we can really rely on in the future. And that's another project that we're actually working on. And a quick follow-up, I guess one, one thing that I found pretty interesting was that I think you had a, a slide in your, uh, in your talk where you actually talked about how you can use partial information because like in the, in the complex case where you have manifolds and maybe you have rankings, um, you might not actually get a labeling function that gives you the complete description of the output, but maybe a partial description, like maybe a pair of edges should exist or something like that if it's a graph or so on. So I'm curious if that that um, is something that you explored more. Yeah, yeah. So we have solutions for lifting to that more general case where you only get partial information. But the solution overall is, is actually quite hard because it turns out that there's very different levels of granularity to these things and combining them in the right way is the major challenge. But we can do it for a bunch of things, especially for rankings where people actually have studied these partial rankings quite a bit. But yeah, it's, it's a very important problem. And indeed, like most of the time we don't get like full information. It's almost impossible, right? Even for like simple regression, yeah. I can't really have a user be like, yeah, the correct label here is 126.13 or something like that. So yeah, you have to allow much more noisy and kind of generic partial information there. Super cool. Thanks so much. Fred, I, I love the presentation and also how smart the idea and how general the idea is to use, you know, distance functions here because it works for across many different data types, right? So that, that's the very cool uh, thing about it that I really, that I really enjoy. Thanks, Piero. <laughs> one, one question that I have about it is, um, so this introduces another dimension in the you know space of possibilities, which is how to choose the. You touched upon it at the very end, right? How to choose that distance function, um, and um, there could be potentially several distance functions there. What I'm curious about is if you experimented with different distance functions and um, how, um, let's say, how 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 flexible it more than flexible, sorry, um, how how robust. It is the general framework with respect to use of different distance functions. 
and if those this if like how how important is that decision in the end yeah that's a great question and and indeed it's exactly right you can actually design almost any distance function you like but you can construct ones that are like totally uninformative like there's always like a trivial distance function that says like you know the point and itself are a distance zero and any other pair of points is like distance infinity and, and that tells you nothing right you get nothing whatsoever from that yeah so typically we use kind of like function distance functions that we're really familiar with which there is usually a canonical one for many spaces and that turned out to work pretty well which suggests that as long as there's some information there things are pretty robust but it did turn out that there's like significant improvements to be had if you pick the right distance functions and what's really interesting is you can start like actually introducing parameters into the distance function. And you know, people do this for very particular kind of metrics. Um, they do this kind of field called metric learning where they say, you know, let's add a bunch of weights into our distance function itself and learn them from data. Um, and if you do that here too, you can get improvements. The only tricky part is it's like task dependent and you might need some labels to figure out like, hey, what's the best possible distance? So that takes away from the nice, you know, zero labels needed kind of approach that we have. But it just shows that, yeah, indeed, there's like a very close connection between these distances and the actual task performance that you end up getting. Right, and so you can also do that with some sort of self-supervision uh, yes. coming from the distances themselves and embed, you were touching upon the-, you know, the Exactly. Embedding. Yeah, it. exactly. Exactly. And yeah, I mean, we don't have like a complete solution there yet, but we have a couple of but kind of promising approaches. The only hard part is for some of these really rich like manifolds, then modifying the distance function can ruin some other properties they have. So you have to be quite careful. But, you know, for all the sort of conventional discrete problems, it's quite easy to parameterize all the metrics and kind of get the right thing there. Mm -hmm. No, that's super cool. I have a really, actually really quick follow up on this, which is um, still on the distance function. Um, in particular for the discrete case, I, I can imagine also there could be some something true for the uh, continuous case, but um, I imagine that may, maybe in particular, if you use like the center of mass or any other you know, criteria similar to majority vote or any sort of interpolation to a certain extent, um, you could end up with um, objects in those spaces that are, may not be valid objects. In particular, I can imagine like parse trees, right? There could be, there are so many syntactical rules there that could make it so that the uh, parse tree that you can end up with after the aggregation or, or, or whatever else um, criteria for selecting the actual label is, that does not, is not a valid one, right? Uh, have you encountered this case? What do you yes. do in this situation? Yeah, yeah, you're, you're actually touching on a really interesting question, which is like, hey, when you want to get this kind of center of mass or even the weighted center of mass, you have to solve some optimization to do that. Um, and in these spaces, you don't necessarily even have gradients to be able to just like go ahead and compute that. But even if you did, you know, these are typically non-convex problems. Um, so these can be really challenging things and you have to be very careful about getting the optimization to work correctly. The interesting thing for us, though, is like, even if you're actually wrong, you don't find the optimal solution, um, you often still find some point that's actually reasonably good. So you might be wrong, but our technique's fairly robust to that. Maybe we're leaving some performance on the table, but it's not too bad. Typically, we'll run the optimization on the actual space of interest. Like, we'll eliminate any point that's not in a space to start with. So we'll only run it on the space itself. So we can't get points that are just not valid at all. Now, if you do things like you're in this hyperbolic case and you just don't run a Euclidean optimization directly on it, then yeah, you'll fall off the manifold for sure. Um, but fortunately, we do have these like pretty powerful techniques there, like Ramani and SGD that will keep you on the manifold no matter what. And the worst case is you can do a projection at the end. There is like a lot of technical intricacies, but yeah, there are ways to solve these kind of challenging optimization issues in general. That makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. And the projection at the end could be also, for instance, in the discrete case, could be something like finding the closest object. In, in exactly. The right. so exactly. On the yeah. manifold that manages it. Makes total sense. This is super cool. Thank you very much, Fred. Fred, um, I'm seeing a lot of great questions in the audience, a lot of great uh, discussion going on. Um, I, I saw a couple uh, uh, questions about um, kind of wondering about the intuition behind the weak supervision. So one person was wondering if you have some labeling functions that are incorrect, how can you actually figure that out if you don't have the, the answers ahead of time? And what kind of assumptions do you need on the overall labeling functions uh, to, to achieve that? Like, do they all need to be a certain amount of good or a certain amount of 
hopefully yeah. they're not all a certain amount of bad but uh what what, what are kind of the the assumptions and intuition going into the there yeah those are great questions so the first thing is like yeah it seems magical that you can figure out these accuracies without knowing really what the true label is the reason we can do that is it turns out that independence is a very very powerful property so as long as these different things are noisy but in different independent ways that information captures enough for you to be able to find out these accuracies. And you know, perhaps this shouldn't be too shocking if you think by analogy to things like learning mixtures, right? So in mixture problems, you just get to see a data set and each item, it came from some mixture component, but you're not told what it is. Even so, there are ways to guarantee that you learn what mixture component or you know what these different mixture components are and what exactly their proportions are right so that's the basic idea there it's all about this kind of independence but yes you need to assume that you have enough independence to begin with and our minimal case there of having these free conditionally independent sources that's the very minimum that you need finally the last question was basically like hey how good or bad do these have to be there's this very rough answer that we have which is things need to be better than uh, better than random on average. Um, it turns out that this isn't really necessary either if you're talking about these distance formulations. There, you can actually solve just based on the distances, which is really neat. But for these kinds of binary cases that we talked about, you have to avoid this adversarial symmetry, right? So you could have you know, all of them actually voting on the reverse label, right? The inverse of the true label, and you would not be able to figure out. But if you have this property of better than random on average, then that's actually sufficient to be able to solve correctly. But yeah, these are reasonably strong assumptions that you need to be able to meet. And there's a lot of really interesting theory behind detecting whether these assumptions are met or not as well. Speaking of these assumptions, I saw a really interesting question in the YouTube chat from, from someone named Joey Harris. Uh, would the labeling model still work if the labeling function's accuracy is actually dependent on the input? Um, and if not, why not? Have yeah. you thought about those cases? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, so there is a recent paper that introduces a new label model, which is called weasel, like the animal. Um, and this is exactly the question that they tackle, basically, which is like, hey, the, the input should determine how difficult a particular point should be, right? So we often think of this in cases like active learning, where you say, yeah, the closer you are to the decision boundary, the more likely you are to be wrong, right, potentially. So that's a classic formulation of this. And this is the basic idea that gets kind of sent into the label model. You have this more complicated label model that actually also depends on where the points are. Um, so the answer is things become trickier, but there are solutions there too. With perhaps the only downside is that there are fewer theoretical guarantees, but the practical performance can be very good by taking that into account. Right. Um, I, I just saw another great question in the audience. Uh, so how is it, how important is diversity of the labeling functions? Is it better to have a few really good labelers or a bunch of really diverse labelers or a mixture of both? Uh, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. So in practice, we actually do have to ask this question a lot. A lot of these labeling functions may do something that we call abstaining that I haven't covered in this talk at all. They might say, I don't know whether I can produce a label for this data point. I just don't have that information accessible to me. Um, and in that case, you know, which happens pretty often, then yeah, you have to deal with the possibility of just having a bunch of points that don't really get a lot of labeling functions. And that's where diversity comes in. If you have a lot of diversity between labeling functions, you'll cover a lot more points and that's very helpful. In general, you want to trade off quality for coverage. Um, if you have extremely high quality, but kind of very low coverage, so you only tackle a few points, uh, then even though you're very accurate, you don't really know how to model much of the data set. Um, so in that case, you actually want perhaps worse quality, worse accuracy, but more diversity. So yeah, this is a real trade-off that we encounter in practice and that we care about. Well, I wanted so to ask, I wanted to ask about how important it is to have labeling functions that work well together, right? So I feel like, you know, weak supervision with a lot of label functions makes a lot of sense. You know, if all of us here on the call are our own labeling function, there might be interesting things like, you know, if Piero thinks, you know, this picture is a tree and I think it is a log, right? Then chances are Piero's right and I'm wrong. But then if Dan comes along and says, no, that's a frog, then chances are it's actually a log, 
You know, you can have these weird kind of things pop up that are infinite dependent, um, but they're not quite, maybe they're not necessarily correlations between labeling functions, yeah. but at times there's patterns where you learn who to trust depending on, you know, who agrees and who disagrees. Is that yeah. something that has been thought about and studied? Yes, yeah, so that idea, we've, we've thought of something related, but we don't have uh, an actual solution for capturing these much richer potential patterns and labeling functions. But you're absolutely right. And this kind of idea of, well, what's about the causality and stuff like that is also something that we thought about for this as well, right? Because you might be thinking, yeah, whenever people make decisions about what a label should be, there's some real underlying cause or a set of causes. And that's really what we want to get at, right? It's it's not really important just what the output is, but what kind of underlying causes are there. Um, I don't know how to do this yet, but it's something that I'm very excited by, um, being able to capture these kinds of richer causal relationships that you kind of get exposed to in the labeling function outputs rather than just kind of blindly plugging them in. So yeah, I like that idea a lot. So I wanted to maybe switch tack and ask, um, since this is an MOSIS seminar, just ask you a little bit about you know, what are your plans for actually um, in terms of system building around this? So, you know, there was a snorkel project and uh, you were obviously uh, at Snorkel yeah, as well. So, you know, can you tell us a little bit about whether you're going to put out, you know, more open source stuff around this uh, general week supervision framework and what's next here? Yeah, I, I appreciate your folks' patience with my theory of ramblings, which are- no, that was great. That was very <laughs> Yeah, so so the answer is, yeah, I mean, Snorkel is a really nice open source framework. And the great thing is that we've actually just built on top of it for the system that we built using these kind of more general settings. Um, we are going to open source that as well as this kind of like additional wrapper for Snorkel. And we're hoping that this actually is usable for a lot of folks not just for kind of these conventional weak supervision uses, but just more general ones. Like I mentioned, kind of combining multiple models without having to have any new label data and things like that. So yeah, we, we view this as a system as much as just like a theoretical technique for solving problems. And we'd like people to use it just as easily as they did the very friendly Snorkel API. Awesome. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm excited to see, you know, uh, how people how people use these techniques and so on. Uh, a different question I had, which maybe is, uh, you know, opening up a Pandora's box, but like, is the relationship between some of the weak supervision work and self-supervision? Um, I think at the beginning of your talk, you talked through, you know, why um, maybe it's not the best idea to get people to label data sets. And so there's, you know, a few competing paradigms, or maybe they're complementary. Uh, it's not clear to me, but what are your thoughts in general about, um, you know, self-supervision being part of this week supervision pipeline and how do you kind of how, how do you use those approaches if you're someone who's trying to build a system for uh solving a problem let's say for like link prediction or something yeah yeah no, I mean, that's a great question and there's no denying the success of self-supervised methods which are incredible and the progress there has been remarkable so i mean the answer is we have to take advantage of that in the weak supervision world as well and i was kind of trying to hint at that by saying like yeah i mean a lot of these labeling functions should basically use representations that people have trained via self-supervision we've actually started a little bit of work on that and and dan is kind of the, the chief of that project with this paper called epoxia a little while ago um, where basically we said yeah labeling functions that abstain a lot you know, we can get them to vote on nearby points by kind of using distances that come from these representations that were obtained from self-supervised training. Um, and it turned out that it was actually really powerful. It improved weak supervision a lot. It got all of these very heavily abstaining labeling functions to vote on a lot more points. And it was very powerful that way. To me, this is just kind of the beginning of how we should use those types of representations. What I'm really interested in is kind of like, interfaces between these different techniques, right? Between different representations. And how can we design them to get the most out of the signal that's contained in all of these different approaches? So I don't fuse, view the future as like, oh, weak supervision has to be better or self-supervision has to be better. We should fuse them as soon as we figure out how to correctly fuse them. And I think the same thing about say generative models as well, um, which I haven't touched on in this talk at all, but they've become extremely powerful. So we should use that signal, that information as well. Yeah, I think actually there was a comment in chat about using um, generative models for 
um, constructing data and also, you know, uh, I think they were specifically talking in the context of regression, but I think, as you said, some more general kind of um, interfaces to be built. Um, yeah, I don't know if other folks, uh, Dan, do you have any thoughts on this general uh, boundary between self-supervision? I know Fred called you out. Yeah, um, I, you know, it's it's pretty cool. It's something that we've been thinking about in some form or another. Uh, I think the entire pandemic um, is the is the is the lifetime of that project. So um, it's it's a uh, it's really cool. Um, Fred, I one of the questions that I, that I love to ask on the seminar, and you know, sometimes it gets deer in the headlights, and sometimes uh, people have really um, awesome answers. Is if you kind of project forward ten years, what does the landscape look like? Um, uh, what what are how do people build models? What are the ways that you uh, kind of like the, the ultimate question is like, there's something in my mind and I want a computer to do the thing in my mind. How do you, how do you think um, people are going to be building uh, machine learning models? Yeah, no, I mean, that's a wonderful question. Yeah, and to me, what's going to happen in the future is really that we're going to have these like rich networks of massive models that are pre-built sort of the way that we have foundation models today, except we're not going to like work on, you know, independent ones that get released every so often. They'll just be this kind of vast array of diverse models that live somewhere and that we have these interfaces to that help us obtain whatever it is that we want to obtain without having to go and, you know, code a new model and PyTorch and pull data and train and stuff like that. So I, I think of the interface question that we just talked about as kind of the critical thing, right? It's how do we access the signal in these extremely rich and information carrying types of objects? And I think we haven't really quite answered that question yet, but we're starting to kind of close in on it. And a lot of the really awesome work about building systems for how to train and store and access models, I think that's actually one of the key steps forward there too. Yeah, and for me, the question is, you know, as more information comes in, how do you update these things, right? How do you keep them up to date? How do you get them to produce correct things? How do you correct them? How do you erase mistakes? And that's gonna become increasingly difficult over time. So I think a lot of our research effort will really be spent there and perhaps quite a bit less on just building more performant models and getting higher accuracy on benchmarks and these kinds of more traditional things that we've been doing. I can just add that I cannot agree more. Like in, in the paper, the one we published with Chris on, on the collective ML system, we start from the same assumption. And, you know, that I think we've, uh, we are really aligned in terms of what we see the, the, the future of ML will look like. So that's, that's super well, cool. Amazing. Speaking of dependencies, you know, I have a dependency on you guys for these kinds of questions. So, you know, keep that in mind there. <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much, Fred, for taking so many questions. I think we're pretty much at the end of the hour. So, uh, you know, uh, thanks to everybody in the audience for, for tuning in. Um, great talk, Fred. And um, next week we're gonna have, I believe it's Bilga Akun from uh, Meta AI, formerly Facebook. Um, and uh, she's gonna be talking to us about designing sustainable data centers with and for AI. So please subscribe to the channel and check out our mailing list on our website, mosis.stanford.eu and see you next week. Bye. Bye everyone. Bye. Thanks for having me.